constellations. Stars. Planets. The universe appears to be infinite. But starting from his tiny dot in one corner of the Milky Way, N is beginning his conquest of it. After his first trial steps, he will one day walk the moon. We can mar such exploits, even as we realize that chances are slight that man will venture personally beyond his own solar system. It is a long way to the stars. One of the slenderest things on our small planet is spider silk. That's why these fine threads are used for crosshairs in delicate optical instruments to study the stars. Spider silk is so fine that one pound would circle the Earth. To reach Alpha Centauri, the nearest star beyond the sun would require one half million tons of silk, enough to fill a train 150 freight cars long. Only by the science of astronomy can we leap across this vastness and, by our eyes, and with special scientific instruments, analyze the elements and atomic structure of distant suns. The sole source of knowledge of objects beyond our solar system is electromagnetic radiation. When the spectroscope was invented, we found we could analyze matter by its radiation. Every chemical element creates a unique set of special lines that we can compare with others. Thus, we can deduce that the entire universe is made up of elements similar to some of those we find on Earth. We see some radiations as colors, but despite the fact that we receive almost all our knowledge through our eyes, the visible spectrum is a narrow one. We might see many new colors if we could see into other wavelengths, such as radio waves, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. And the light invisible to us can tell us much about the mysteries of space. Already, this invisible light has led us to a new understanding of the universe and provided unsuspected puzzles for our solution. The envelope of air which protects life on Earth also screens out or absorbs the starlight in this portion of the spectrum. And it is these invisible radiations that could one day tell us how stars are born and die and how the universe was created. For Earth-bound astronomers, the challenge is tantalizing. Telescopes on brief rocket flights have brought us hints of entities we never knew existed. And balloon flights have lifted telescopes eight miles into the air to take some of the clearest photographs of the sun ever obtained. From Earth-bound views like this to this, Yes, it is beyond the air that we must go if we seek a clearer image of the heavens. Above distortion that makes the stars twinkle, above the blotter of air that absorbs the ultraviolet, the X-rays, the gamma rays, on which much of the study of starlight depends. We need a solid platform, hundreds of miles out in space, from which to make our studies. Not a rocket, not a balloon, but an orbiting astronomical observatory. And that is what has been developed by scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center, where Dr. James Kuperian headed a group of distinguished astronomers. To know the stars, we must capture starlight, light that is cut off forever from human eyes on Earth. For this, we need special telescopes. There are such telescopes, and here is Dr. Arthur D. Code, who helped design one of them at the University of Wisconsin. 
radiation that comes to us from celestial objects spans the entire electromagnetic spectrum, from the long radio waves through the infrared and visible light into the X-ray and gamma ray region. The Wisconsin telescopes are designed to observe in the ultraviolet region beyond the range of visibility of the eye Space contains not only many old stars like our sun, a few billion years old, but young blue stars, only a few hundred thousand of years of age. These young hot stars give off most of their light in the ultraviolet, a region which does not penetrate the Earth's filtering atmosphere. The Wisconsin telescopes will be able to see these hot young stars. They will measure the energy distribution and the intensity of light from young stars, something never before possible. From these studies and many more, we hope to learn more about how stars are born, age, and die, and how matter is reborn into the universe. This telescope was invented in the 17th century by Monsieur Cassegrain, medieval but a modern version will aid man's knowledge of space. Dr. James Kuperian of the Goddard Space Flight Center has, with the help of other NASA astronomers, devised a new way to use Cassegrain's ancient telescope. The Goddard telescope system has been developed by us to explore ultraviolet radiation of stars in a manner somewhat similar to that of the Wisconsin telescopes. The emphasis, however, is on increased spectral resolution. With the Goddard telescope in space, we can sample radiations emitted from within our own galaxy and compare them to emissions from galaxies tens of millions of light years distant. It's an exciting prospect. With the OAO, man will go a long way toward solving the mystery of the creation of matter. Through our new window on the universe, we shall search the stars in many ways. An early project will be the mapping of the entire sky by ultraviolet light. In charge of making this unique celestial map is Dr. Fred Whipple. The new map of the universe, which will be very different from these maps, will be made by telescope. With four such ground-controlled telescopic cameras, we intend to make an all-sky map in four separate ultraviolet colors. In addition, we plan to catalog more than 30,000 very hot stars, much brighter than the sun, many times more than astronomers have previously recorded in the ultraviolet. Among other objects, an ultraviolet map of the sky will study pockets of interstellar gas and dust clouds. Some are dark, some almost invisible from Earth. These vast clouds in space may hold clues as to how stars are born. An OAO project developed in the Space Telescope Program of Princeton University will investigate these provocative dark areas. Dr. Donald Morton describes it. This telescope can be used for many different kinds of observations, but at Princeton we have a particular study in mind. Not all clouds are as dark as this one in Orion, but it is apparent that the space between the stars is not empty, but filled with great clouds of dust and gas. As starlight travels towards us, the atoms in these clouds absorb part of the spectrum. By observing these areas in ultraviolet light with our spectrometer, it's possible to deduce the density and chemical composition of the interstellar gas. All the telescope packages will be working in the same range of wavelengths, but there will be a difference in the sharpness of resolution. For example, the Smithsonian and Wisconsin telescopes will take the initial broad approach with low resolution studies in bands 500 to 10 angstroms wide. The Goddard telescope will examine this same radiation with medium resolution in bands from 10 angstroms down to one. And for the Princeton package, there remains high resolution, down to 1 20th of an angstrom. Astronomers have long believed that new stars are formed by the condensation of interstellar gas and dust.
With our OAO, we hope to determine the density and chemical composition of this tenuous material. And then we may be able to better understand the process of star formation. This satellite, the OAO, is the biggest and most complex unmanned satellite in the NASA program. Built by the Grumman Aircraft Corporation, it is basically a shell into which various kinds of telescopes can be mounted. When it has been placed in an orbit 500 miles beyond the Earth, this space observatory will give us eyes to see into regions until now invisible to man. by a Centaur rocket, the OAO sheds its protective fairings in space. The OAO powers itself through solar paddles, storing electrical energy derived from sunlight. Once in orbit, it relies on solar sensors and star trackers to stabilize itself. Then it opens its eyes to look through a new window in the universe. With each succeeding year, a new OAO will be orbited. The first one in space carries telescope packages in both ends. From a ground control station, men reach into space 500 miles to point the OAO toward any part of the sky they wish to study. Precision is such that the OAO could fix on the eraser of a pencil 100 miles away. Observations can be stored by magnetic memory. And all information flashed to Earth within seconds. Recorded as numerical data, starlight images can be translated into pictures by the trained scientists. The OAO will be another significant advance in astronomy since Galileo aimed the first telescope to prove the Earth was not the center of the universe. From the time when prehistoric man wondered at the bright pinpoints in the sky, astronomy has developed as a challenge. The OAO, the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory, will extend man's range of vision across the universe. Man, on his tiny planet, a sand grain on the shoreline of the seas of infinity, longs to find out what the stars are why they are there, how they came to be there, vast in the immensities of space that may or may not have a beginning or an end. Hello? Hey. Hi. Skip Alzheimer. Sorry about I didn't show up after I showed the silent film, uh, but I'm on a call um, that I'm trying to wrap up. Anyway, so that narrator um, did a lot of uh, TV commercials, including ones for AT&T, and he also appears in this film. Uh, so watch this. I make obscene telephone calls. The best calls. Calls that no one can resist. I have perfected this highly specialized art to the point where, if I wanted to, I could seduce the President of the United States. But I have no political ambitions. See the telephone book. The story of a girl who falls in love with the world's greatest obscene phone call. Streaming. It's it's absurd to hear his voice uh, in this movie. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely an awesome thing. So let's learn about the molecule of heredity while I finish up this call. Enjoy.
It's about the size of the point of a dull pin. Here's another egg, about the same size as the other. But this isn't a human egg. It's the egg from which a sea urchin develops. How does each of these egg cells know what it's supposed to develop into? For instance, how does the human egg cell know that it's supposed to develop into a human being? It knows because the cell contains an elaborate set of directions or specifications for making people, not sea urchins. These specifications determine what color our hair will be, whether we will be male or female. To a large extent, they determine what we will look like, and they determine many thousands of important things about the way we will grow and develop. Most of these specifications are contained in the nucleus, the microscopic central sphere of the egg cell, located in tiny bodies called chromosomes. The specifications we call genes. I'm now going to ask five questions about these specifications and then tell you what we think the answers might be. First, how are the specifications transmitted from one generation to another? I'm going to illustrate with some mice. This mouse has genes in each of his cells that contain specifications that say he will produce brown pigment. This one has specifications that say she will not produce pigment. And the lack of pigment leaves her with white fur. If these two mice mate together and produce offspring, each will contribute specifications through egg and sperm cells to the offspring. The mother for no pigment, the father for brown pigment. The sons and daughters will therefore have two sets of specifications concerning the color of their fur. Now, how are the specifications written? This mouse has specifications that say, in effect, I cannot produce pigment. This woman is an albino. She also has genes carrying specifications that say, I cannot produce pigment. Now we know we don't have words and sentences in our cells written in the 26 letters of our alphabet. But nevertheless, the information is there. We can write, I cannot produce pigment in a simple code using only two symbols, dots and dashes. To someone who knows the Morse code, this says, I cannot produce pigment. The specifications for the development of the fertilized egg cell are written in a code that uses four symbols. The code is written in long spiral staircase-like molecules of a substance called deoxyribonucleic acid. It's called DNA for short. Now this is a model of a molecule of DNA. DNA molecules are made of a large number of atoms and are quite complicated. But they are made of smaller, less complex units, and it's the way these smaller units are arranged that determines what the code is saying in each particular piece of DNA. Let's look at a simplified diagram of a DNA molecule. If we were to untwist the spiral, the basic shape of a DNA molecule would be somewhat like a ladder. The long supports are made up of connected subunits of sugar and phosphate. We'll indicate these with the letters S and P. The rungs, or connecting pieces, are two units each and are of four different kinds. We can simply label them A, T, C, and G. Each connecting rung of the DNA molecule is made up of two of them. An A is always combined in a rung with a T and a C is always combined with a G. However, they can be combined in either direction. And the rungs can be arranged in any order. Now the Morse code has two symbols, dots and dashes, and the order in which they appear indicates what letter they stand for. The DNA code has four symbols, and the order in which they are strung together 
is the code that spells out the specifications that tell the egg cell how to develop. Now, of course, this code doesn't form letters and words, but it does record information that controls and directs the development of an egg into a fully grown organism. Located on one of the chromosomes of this albino woman is a piece of DNA that says in some way in its four symbol code, I cannot produce pigment. It's been estimated that it takes from a thousand to 10,000 of these code units arranged in a particular order to encode such a specification. Just imagine how many different specifications it takes to determine how you will develop. There are some for the color of your hair, others for the color of your eyes, others for your blood type. Each of us has perhaps 100,000 separate specifications contained in the fertilized egg cell from which we develop. Collectively, these 100,000 specifications add up to a kind of a recipe for us. They say how to make us out of the egg cell, given time, food, proper temperature, and so forth. If we express all this information in English, it would fill about a thousand volumes. Yet all this information is contained in that tiny microscopic sphere that is the nucleus of the fertilized egg cell. This fertilized egg cell is the beginning of a human life. Now let's examine how does it develop into a human being. Do you know what mitosis is? Mitosis is the way a cell is divided into two cells. It's the way new cells are made. That's right. It's through the process of mitosis that we develop from one fertilized egg cell to an organism with millions of cells. Here we see a cell divided by the process of mitosis. The time is sped up by the camera. Actually, it takes much longer. You'll study mitosis in some detail later. But what I want you to consider now is what happens to the specifications in the nucleus of the cell when the cell divides. What do you think happens? Do they divide some way too? That's absolutely right, they do. When a cell divides, the two new cells contain the same specifications the parent cell contains. That means that the specifications, that thousand volumes worth of information you remember, have been reprinted into every nucleus of every single cell in your body. And remember, you have millions of them. The reprinting of the specifications is directly tied in with the structure of the DNA molecules on which the specifications are coded. Several kinds of experiments indicate that the reprinting occurs by separation of the molecule into two halves, followed by the formation of new partners by each half. Now there is a complete DNA molecule for the nuclei of each of the two new cells. We'll look at that more closely and see exactly what happens. When the halves of the DNA molecule separate, they separate between the two units of the connecting bonds along the molecule. In the cells in which this is happening, and it's happening in your cells right now, there are many single subunits made from the food we eat. When these come into contact with their proper partners, they are held in place. An A only joins with a T, a C with a G. Now a complete new molecule is formed, identical to the parent molecule. The coded specification it carries has been reprinted just as it was, because the sequence of the code symbols in the half that came from the old molecule controls exactly the sequence in the new half that is formed. This is a molecular model of the G subunit of the DNA molecule. It's magnified 100 million times. Imagine that it's part of one of the halves left after the DNA molecule is divided. This is a model of a T subunit. Imagine that it's free in the cell. If it tries to join with a G subunit, it won't hold, doesn't fit. 
But when a C subunit comes along, it fits perfectly. From one DNA molecule carrying its coded specification, two exactly like the original are formed. These go into the two daughter cells that result from the division of the parent cell. In terms of molecules, this is the basis of all biological reproduction. This reprinting of the specifications from cell to cell is done with high precision. There's perhaps only one typographical error that is only one misplaced symbol for each reprinting of the thousands of DNA molecules in a single cell. Remember, the information encoded in these molecules is equivalent to 1,000 printed volumes. Reprinting that information amounts to a typist copying 1,000 volumes and making only one significant typographical error. What about the occasional mistakes in DNA specifications? Mistakes in reprinting, like typographical errors, or mistakes that occur in other ways. We call these mistakes mutations. Usually, mutations give rise to wrong recipes and are harmful. For example, if there's a mistake in the DNA specifications for a hemoglobin protein, the hemoglobin made according to this specification will be defective. This is a cell with normal hemoglobin, the red pigment molecules of your blood that are necessary for carrying oxygen through the circulatory system. This is a cell with defective hemoglobin. It's called sickle cell hemoglobin because the red cells containing it are distorted, often in the shape of a sickle. This defective hemoglobin occurs in man when there is a mistake in the DNA instructions for producing hemoglobin. Such cells come to an untimely end, and the bearer of them suffers from sickle cell anemia and often does not live to maturity. Now, I don't want you to think that all mutations are unfavorable. As a matter of fact, most of them are. But you'll learn that the entire process of evolution has depended upon favorable mutations. We have evolved from one-celled creatures of billions of years ago through errors in DNA specifications that have improved the recipe for the organism in which they occurred. This is the principle behind the development of hybrid seed and livestock. And it's the principle nature has used in the development of such complex creatures as ourselves, able to cope with our environments in a remarkably satisfactory way. I hope I've aroused your curiosity about these amazing DNA molecules that carry your biological specifications. If you want to learn more about them, and there is much more no one yet knows, I strongly urge you to first learn as much as possible about the chemistry of simpler molecules. Such study will be well worthwhile, because in a real sense, DNA holds the secret of life itself. All right, probably the mo not the most scintillating uh, speaker, <laughs> um, but uh, visually interesting. And uh, someone pointed out that the soundtrack where the, the woman's typing, it was also in uh, Keeping Neat and Clean, which was another great cornet film. Uh, and when I heard that, I was like, ooh, my ears per perked up because we actually used to use that in a sample that we did back in the day. Uh, because it would play that and it would say, hard work, isn't it? Um, so anyways, uh, so behind me, behind me, I have a film scanner, Blackmagic Sintel film scanner. And we have a film, two films hooked up. Uh, and we'll try to get through at least one of them. And uh, this first one has water damage. And so what I did is I expanded the frame so you could see the full frame and see how beautiful and yet horrible water damage is. 
basically what happens is this was probably part of Hurricane Fran. Hurricane Fran, which basically hit the house that I was renting with my roommates. And what happened was uh, we got about a foot of water in the basement and the power went out and the sump pumps weren't working. So there was all this water. And so what happened is it, the water started seeping into some of the cans. So you're gonna see problems at the beginning then at some point it should stop. And I don't think it will, I think that this will be okay. Uh, so anyways, here is, I believe it's basketball fundamentals uh, with water damage. Enjoy. skills are the foundation upon which winning battles are built. Practice and drill on win ball games. Accurate shooting and dribbling begin with the of the hands on the ball. The thick spread but comfortable and the ball from the palms of the hands. Dribbling is one way the ball may be moved across. To avoid losing the ball, dribble low and as close to the body as possible. The player is in a crouched position. His head is up with his arms looking ahead. Here in slow motion, we see how the ball is handled. Using the fingers and wrist, the ball is pushed to the floor. It is not slapped. Successful passing requires speed, accuracy, and confident ball handling, which comes from constant practice. In the two-handed push pass, the ball is held chest high and delivered with a straightforward pushing movement. The ball is released with a strong finger and wrist snap, with the palms of the hands facing the flight of the ball. Good follow-through of the hands and arms is important. The two-handed bounce pass is also started from the chest. But the ball is pushed to the floor as near the opponent's feet as possible. The eye should be looking straight ahead and not down at the floor. Another effective pass is the one-handed bounce pass. The ball is carried to passing position with two hands and released with one. The short baseball pass is very good for getting the ball to the pivot man. The ball is brought up with two hands and released with one. Notice the strong finger and wrist snap. The long baseball pass for distance is given power by bringing the ball farther back past the shoulder and throwing it with a strong whip of the arm. The hook pass can be used to feed an open man when the defensive player guards closely. This pass is made by jumping from the floor and hooking the pass while in the air. The player takes off on the left foot when passing with the right hand. Landing with a broad base, a player is ready to move in any direction. Handling the body is as important as handling the ball. 
Quick stopping practice helps to attain good body balance. This is the stride stop. It is made with the knees and hips fully bent into a crouch to keep the body balanced. The rear turn, or reverse pivot, is useful when coming up to a defensive man in order to protect the ball or to pass back to another player. After the player has turned, the ball is held fairly close to the body to prevent losing it. A front turn or front pivot can also be used to carry a player away from a defensive threat. He stops in a low crouch, makes a crossover, and steps away from the defensive man. A well-executed change of direction will sometimes lose the defensive man or free the player for a shot or a pass. The player pushes off on the foot opposite to the direction he is moving. A change of pace is used to lose the defensive man when dribbling. Dribbling slowly, the player pauses just long enough to deceive the defensive man. This action is completed with a drive to the basket. A change of direction while dribbling may also lose the defensive man. The player fakes with his head and shoulders. The player dribbles with the outside hand, keeping his body between the ball and the defensive man. When receiving a pass, the player can use a head and shoulder fake to draw the defensive man to one side. Then the dribble is started in the opposite direction. When guarding a man in position to shoot, the defensive man has one foot forward one hand moving above the head, and the other hand moving at his side. He's close enough to the offensive man to keep him from shooting, but still in position to move quickly to prevent him from going around. If he moves closer to the offensive man, the defensive man does not cross-step, but slides either forward, backward, or to either side, keeping his knees bent and his body close to the floor. The defensive man should at all times be ready to force the offensive man into doing something with the ball. When the ball is passed, the first move of the defensive man is to release a step or back away from the passer into a basketball stance, knees bent and both hands extended. When a shot is taken, it's important for the defensive player to screen out his opponent. This is done by use of a pivot. Screening out prevents the offensive man from getting a rebound. On a rebound, the defensive man jumps as high as possible to get the ball. Scoring in basketball is done by field goals and free throws. Let's look first at the jump shot. The player is in a well-balanced position with feet spread comfortably. With the knees flexed, the arms bring the ball up to shooting position. The right hand is under the ball as it's released toward the basket. The jump shot is one of the most important offensive maneuvers in basketball.
In the hook shot, the player starts with his back to the basket. The arm is extended as the ball is released. With a follow through of the wrist, the ball is hooked toward the basket. The hook shot must be developed with both the left and right hands. When shooting for the basket in many fast plays, the ball is released with one hand. The player dribbles in from the side of the basket. In order to keep his body between the defensive man and the ball, the player shoots with his outside hand. When the play carries the man very close to the basket, he crosses over and lays the ball back up on the backboard with the opposite hand. Coming from the left, the player dribbles with his left hand, crosses over, and when almost directly under the basket, jumps up and lays the ball on the backboard with his right hand. A reverse layup can be executed when the player finds himself too far under the basket. On a fast break, a player can drive straight down the middle and lay the ball up. Free throws demand much practice. The two-handed free throw may either be executed underhand or overhand. The free throw shooter takes his position with both feet at the line or with one foot slightly back, whichever is most comfortable. He brings the ball down as he bends his knees, then swings it easily upward and outward. The ball is released face high with a full follow through. The one-handed free throw requires that the ball be placed in the most comfortable position for the individual player. Here the ball rests on the fingers of the left hand. The right hand is on the side, with the right wrist flexed back slightly. The arm and wrist action of free throw shooting is again determined by the individual. The ability to score regularly from the free throw line wins many ball games. Learning these fundamental skills, such as shooting, dribbling, passing, body handling, and defensive play, will help make winning basketball teams. Practice to attain these skills will develop fine basketball players. So, um, yeah, uh, so you saw the damage, and then also there was this weird problem with the uh, stabilization of the frame, and that is a problem with uh, the Sintel. Like, basically, the letters that go past where the sprockets are are uh, problematic. Uh-oh, I got another thing starting. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and watch this.
Once there was a little boy named Reggie, who never seemed to have the time to take very good care of his things. And whenever someone came to his house to play, there was trouble. What you doing? Not big trouble, but trouble. Sure, how do you play? Like when Horace wanted to play with Reggie's new game. For all the pieces. I don't know. So many parts were missing. Where could they be hiding? Let's look under the bed for them. Okay, let's under. Look at all the stuff on the bed. What is all this junk? How do I know? Well, I will never find them. Maybe they'd play with Reggie's fire engine instead. It's busted. Uh oh. <laughs> Too. Reggie remembered uh, he'd stepped on it. Before you can sit down. I like it. I like a messy room like this. How about uh, doing some coloring? What a messy drawer. Reggie has lots of crayons. But who could find anything in that mess? Poor Horace. He was getting tired of all this. Maybe he'd just read that book of Reggie's he'd liked so much. What'd you do to but it? But look at it. Oh, yes. Reggie had left it outside one day. I can't read this all muddy. And that night it rained. Where do you want to play football? Yeah. Could they go out and play football? How can we play? There's no air in it. Guess not. And when they found the air pump, There's no needle. the needle valve was missing. Oh, well, I think I know where it is. And of course, Reggie thought he knew where it was, but he just couldn't remember. I'm going home. Well, that's the way it was for the little boy who didn't seem to be able to take very good care of his own things. That evening, his mother and father came in to say good night. They saw his room was a mess, and because they wanted to help, they started to clean it up. Perhaps they weren't really helping him by picking up after him all the time. If they only knew of a way to help Reggie learn to take care of his things himself. That night, during the magic hours, unusual things began to happen. Are they gone yet? Not yet. So shh, shh. Let's tiptoe. Is he asleep? Are you sure he's quiet, asleep? Quiet. Yes, I think so. Yeah, he's asleep. Yes, definitely asleep. Everybody, come on. We're going to have a meeting. Yeah, over. Reggie's our friend. We should help him. We've got to let Reggie know that we're not happy. That we don't like what's going on, right? Right, right. We've got to show Reggie that he has to take care of us. We've got to. Sure as possible. This has gone too far. How can a football live without air? Air! I'm always so ashamed of how I look. I feel so run down with my broken ladder. And I got two flat tires. Man, he never folds us. And I don't like having messy drawers either. He, he doesn't, doesn't take, take care, care of us. His, his own things. things. His so own things. He gets so angry. Yeah, and we've, we've got, got to help him learn how to take care of his own things. things. Right? Right. 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 Yeah. We won't let him play with us unless he takes care of us. Uh, we won't let him wear us unless he takes care of us. <laughs> you keep away from him. We'll streak away from him. You'll notice what's happening. But just in case he doesn't, somebody should explain everything to Reggie. I think it should be the bear. Yes, that big old bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that's the most reasonable. Yeah, he's the biggest, yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. I'll do it. Here goes. What? Two, three, go! Come on, just do it, man! Oh, 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 o
is your bed. Speaking on behalf of all your toys and clothes and the other things you own. Oh, yeah. 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 We have something important to tell you. You see, Reggie, we are not happy. You don't take care of us. If you want to use us anymore, Reggie, you've got to take care of us. Goodbye. Hold on. Do you see, Reggie, if you don't change your ways, it's goodbye. 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 Uh-uh-uh, not anymore, brother. Thank you, Nari. Quick. And goodbye. Hello, and goodbye again. I don't want you using us anymore. No, you can't wash us. Do you don't take care of us? Hey, see you later. Goodbye. Hey, the room is crazy. Reggie, it's true. We are angry, but we're still your things. And we'd like you to take care of us. You don't think you know how? Oh, you do. Oh, sure you do. Come on, pick us up. Put us away. Take care of us right. And then we'll let you use us, okay? Good boy. All right? Okay. Let's get started. Anywhere will do. This is our everywhere. We've all been talking about it. We'll even help you if you promise not to tell. Take care of us right. And we'll be glad to let you use us. Always. That's a good idea. Reggie, you know where we go. Would you put us away, please? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Reggie, you're doing fine. You want to put us away, too? Thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Come on, pick me up. See? It's not so hard, is it, Reggie? And we all appreciate it. I want to be put away, too. Be next. Oh, that's the idea, Reggie. Keep it up. Hey, Reggie's doing a dandy job, eh, fellas? <laughs> How about putting me away, Reggie? My pieces are scattered all over the floor. Yeah, that's a good idea. Hey, it's looking pretty well around here, is it? Mm-hmm. It most certainly is. Well, that's the last one. Thanks for putting all my pieces back inside my box, Reggie. I appreciate that. Thanks for helping me. You'd better put me away or I'll snitch on you, you stinker. Sorry, I'm not doing the rain. Shh, wait a minute, I heard someone. Shh, shh. I wonder if Reggie will put those away. Mom didn't even notice I cleaned my room. Well, Reggie, what are you going to do about those clothes? I think he's going to put us away. Oh, yes. <laughs> neatly, neatly, that's a good little boy. <laughs> oh, you're sorry about the fire engine, aren't you, Reggie? We know you are. And if you try to fix my ladder, I'll really be happy. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, will really make me happy. It'll fill me up with joy. I'll buy you a new needleville. <laughs> oh, Reggie, look how happy you've made us all. <laughs> What's he cutting out, scissors? <laughs> Big red check. What for? I don't know. <laughs> He's putting a big red check up on his bulletin board so he'll always remember to check his room pretty neat. Huh? Smart little boy. Good idea, Reggie. Always check the things in your room and your things will always be happy. I'm so happy I'm going to help you this morning. Here, Reggie, let me... Find my covers up for you. And just wait until your parents see your room. Oh, but we mustn't tell them how we got your room so clean. Can you keep it a secret? I don't know. The rest of us are good at keeping secrets. Aren't we, gang? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we. I kept a secret one for three years. I won't tell anybody. I wouldn't tell a soul. No, no. Quiet, everyone. Here they come. <laughs> 
Look at this. I I don't believe what? it. Reggie. Come here, Reggie. The room is clean. Fantastic. You cleaned up your room. What What happened? How did you do it? The toys put themselves away. The toys put themselves away. The toys put themselves away. Sure. Listen, you know what? This deserves a treat. Okay. Yeah. You've been such a good boy. Come on, let's get ice cream. Yes, I was all discombobulated all, all during this lunchtime streaming show. But I hope that that film made it okay. Uh, I was whacked out. Uh, again, it was one of those films that the 50s version of it is very sedate. Um, and this one just goes crazy. It becomes supernatural. Um, and that's, I think... I, my theory was the fact that kids were already inundated with so much media because of television and movies, mostly television, that they felt like they had to up their game to, to capture a kid's attention. And this was obviously one way to do that, to create something provocative and, and interesting. Uh, wow. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. I hope uh, you guys have a great weekend. Uh, I'm going to try again the assembly line sleep machine with some new clips and new, new sounds and we'll start it running maybe this evening and let it run until sunday night or monday morning i don't know we'll see and it's a way i'm trying to create a soothing environment of watching assembly line and manufacturing footage uh, maybe a little on the creepy side i'm trying to make it less creepy and more soothing but if you like what you saw hit those thumbs up buttons hit the uh, notification button hit the like uh, you can also hit the super thanks button if you're on YouTube. And you can also donate via uh, patreon.com slash avgeeks or ko-fi.com, coffee.com slash avgeeks. Those are ways to support us. And you can also watch other avgeeks things on the YouTube channel. And we they'll show you an ad which will put a penny in a jar for us. <laughs> Actually, it's a little bit more than that. But uh, it's it's a way to support what we do. And uh, I think I'm going to take all of my employees out to lunch because it's nice outside. Uh, and uh, you guys have a, a great weekend. I very much appreciate your attention, your eyeballs, your comments. And we will see you on Monday. Take care. <laughs>